more than happy to create controversy, to come into groups and to create controversy without ever doing the respect to learn and listen to what has already been done. Well, I hope those that listen to the call and I hope those that are on the call take heed. Don't be suckered in by people who are still in the game of making sweeping statements to you because they may have the skill of speaking at the expense of the work and knowledge. As I said to you, if one wishes to be a true general executor, it will be the hardest thing you ever do. And never follow an idiot. And never follow a fool. And if people make sweeping statements, if people are promoting that you don't need competence, then they are fools. They are idiots. The hardest thing you will ever do is be a general executor. Because to be a true general executor is to live your life, to speak your life in the manner of Jesus Christ. If someone says, follow the Bible, and they have no comprehension of exactly what Jesus Christ was doing as general executor, then there is the evidence you're listening to or speaking to or giving time to a fool. Don't give time to fools. Muhammad, Buddha, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses, all these figures of history are examples of what it takes to be in the office of general executor. And so it requires study and patience and learning. And that's what we're doing. Well, moving on. The next word I want to cover, because tonight we've covered that citizen and that surname deliberately came in the same package of the civil code of the 19th century. And you might see that there's a bit of a pattern appearing here. And indeed, that's what we've been unearthing. The pattern of the switchover between the estates and the original system of common law into the structure of corporations that we live with today. Now, about this time, we see that there was also a transition when the system decided that they would abolish slavery. And so you see in a number of places great reference to the abolition of slavery, certainly by the time of the 1830s. An example of that is the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, where if you talk to anyone today and you say to them that we are a slave, they'll laugh at you. They'll say you can't be a slave because slavery was abolished in the 19th century. Indeed, it was. But what did they replace it with? They did replace it, because the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 actually tells you what they replaced the word and the concept of slavery with. You see, what people teach you today, and what I was taught, is that when they abolish slavery, they abolish not just the word of slavery, but all the concepts around slavery. That's what you're led to believe. Well, that's not true. They reorganized the concepts and they stopped using the word, but they replaced it. And in this act, they tell you what they replaced it with. And guess what they replaced it with? The word slave ceased to be used and the word that replaced it was Apprenticed laborers. Apprenticed laborers. Which is a fancy way of saying an indentured servant. Apprentice laborers under the control of the unions. But what is the, one of the great things we're taught? The unions are there to protect our rights. Have you heard that one before? The unions are there to protect our rights. That's straight out of the Fabian Society. Well, the concept of unions and belonging to unions and being a member of a union didn't come out of the worker rights of the 19th century. It came out of a structure of organising the paupers, the people who had lost their land in common. The people who had been kicked off the land had been thrown into work, into workhouses that were worse than prisons to work till they died for a union. 
they worked for a union because the structure of parishes were unions. And that was a structure. So they didn't simply eliminate the concepts of people working effectively as slaves. They just changed the label. They reorganized the workforce. We all became apprentice laborers under the control of councils and unions in the Slavery of Abolition Act of 1833. Well, switching gears now to talk about a word and talk about some concepts that we uh, mentioned last week. And we mentioned last week that the trickery of will and testament is that they don't record, they don't permit the recording of a will and testament. Now, when we looked at that, we looked at what is the record and we just, we discovered that there is a passage in the Wills Act that defines that, so let me call that out now. I've got that here. Okay, and that passage is uh, number V, number five, where it speaks of us uh, recording it into what's called the court roles. Now, court roles is a definition which refers to the roles of a manor, and it was the uh, belonged to the lord of the manor, and it was not necessarily a public book, but it was considered a, a private register. When they changed manners to councils, then that became the county record. And then a roll uh, is considered a, uh, a schedule of parchment uh, or an issue roll. And that on that roll were the names, the rents, the services of the tenants. So if you're on that roll, you're considered a tenant. Okay, that's fine. What we discovered in terms of recording is that when you go to a county recorder or in places like Canada or Australia where you don't have that now, you've got a central land registry office, they've already made the requirement under the corporation that you cannot register a will unless it is approved by probate. In other words, unless you admit you don't have a will, you can't register a will. <laughs> and if you can't record a will, then you have no will. <laughs> so that just shows you how stupid the corporations become. I don't know stupid or mischievous, but, but clearly it's a point that's unsustainable. If one brought a court case, then they can't support the argument. I mean, I mean you can't say we won't record a will until we have record that you don't have a will. And that's basically what they're saying. But that just shows you how stupid the corporations become. And I think I mentioned last week that when people went down and looked at the recording component of their will, uh, it was discovered that in most of these counties, in, in most of these places, no one has recorded the existence of a will for decades, for absolute decades. So let's talk about the ritual of recording and why this is such an important understanding for us to realize. If you look at a will, which requires for a will to be perfected, to be perfected notice, to be a perfected deed, it requires that the testator, who is the grantor, signs, but signs in the presence of at least two witnesses. And then the signature of those witnesses and the signing of the testator. So the entire event then is witnessed and sealed by a notary. So the testator signs to testate, to testify that the document is correct, to, to uh, give their sign, their seal to the document. The witnesses are there to witness the testator doing it so that it's legitimate, it's been done legitimately in the presence of others. And then the notary is there to witness the entire event. And that perfects the document. If you look at the Roman ritual that was established in the 16th century, then that is the same procedures required for almost all deeds, excluding deed polls. Now, personally, I think some of the 
ritual and hocus pocus of the Roman cult is ridiculous. But it's their rules, it's their laws, and if we live in their societies, then they can determine what those rules are. But they made very clear the rules of what perfect an instrument. And what people think is that once you've done that, then the instrument is perfected, uh, it's perfected notice. Now it's true, prior to the corporations taking over, these instruments were held in due course by a notary who then provided a folio, which was the notary's version of a register, and then they were effectively on the public record. But once the corporation took over, they went, no, 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 that's not good enough. We're starting again and we're going back to the basics. And if it's not on one of the registers that we control, we don't care about these notaries anymore. It's not in one of the registers. And if you don't have a valid record of the event of going into our valid register, then you don't have title. If you don't have title, you don't have ownership. So let's look at this ritual then that goes beyond merely the document. And the ritual I'm referring to is the very meaning of the word record. And we use it all the time. What do we mean by record? What we mean by record is the word record comes from two Latin words. It comes from res, re, property, form, and cordus. And cordus meaning heart, mind, body, and soul. So when we speak to the word record, we're saying property of the heart, mind, body, or soul. We're referring to the literal creation of the property. The recording creates the property, not the deed. It's the recording into their register that creates the property. And that's why they're using the word. Well, if the property is created by the sacred ritual or unholy ritual, one or the other, of going into a register, then one would presume that witnessing that event and having some uh, evidence of that event is of the utmost importance. And indeed it is. The trick is that under their system, when the actual entry is made, if you do not have then created at that time one of two documents, they're both called certificates. In fact, the, the word is certificate. If a certificate, which is a secular word for a remittance, a remittance is a receipt and the remittance is the completion of the cycle of an indulgence. There you go. We see the continuation of a, of a ritual beginning in the 13th century, that the receipt, the remittance, the perfection of the indulgence, the certificate, if it is not created at the time of the entry of the record, then you do not have an original certificate. You do not have perfected title. You do not have original title. Why? because you did not gain a valid witnessed, sealed and signed receipt, certificate of that event. You merely have a copy. And what the Roman system has built in, and it's brilliant for its thievery, is if you don't have the original certificate then the original claim vests with the state. They own the property. They own what was registered. Now, you've probably heard many times, and it is a valid point, where people say to you, don't play with their registers. Don't you realize what their registers are? If you put something in their registers, they own it. Well, now you know how they own it. Because if you don't obtain... At the instant the record is made, a certificate, then you don't have original title. And if you don't have original title, they own it. All you can ever get is a certificate of title, a copy, a registered copy, 
you will only ever have equitable title, like that little piece of paper they call the bird.